We're in the 11th chapter of the book of Acts again today. I'm going to pick up where we left off last week, starting in verse 19. It is a pleasure always when reading the book of Acts to pay attention to how the Holy Spirit worked in the building of the church as it spread from Jerusalem through Judea, Samaria, and finally beyond. The Gentiles scattered around the world were to be the focus point after a while where Paul would go and preach the gospel with clarity and power. And I love the way the church is shaped by the working of the Holy Spirit. Uh, just God anointing the gospel, carrying that message to people, bringing conviction, changing hearts, and bringing people out of darkness into light. And those people who truly uh, believed, who were truly transformed by the gospel, always had something to say about Him. They didn't have to be told to go and talk about Jesus. Jesus had become their life, the God they had begun to worship, the one that they prayed to, went to the Father through the Son always, and they knew Him, He having made Himself known to them. And so having been transformed on the inside, they were new persons. And when they were scattered by persecution, those who were truly transformed had to tell somebody. Some of you probably can remember when you first became a Christian, you had to tell somebody. You had to hug somebody. You had to say, I love you to somebody. And then after a while, you were able to sit with somebody and tell them how much you loved Jesus. Each of you were firing it back and forth, encouraging our journey as we started. So when I read this text in a short, verses 19 to 26 for today, you'll notice that as the people scattered from the persecution in Jerusalem, and this is back to that statement which showed up in chapter 8, uh, basically the same kind of thing being said again right here at verse 19. So let me read the text and then we'll get into it. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution, that's the persecution against the Christians in Jerusalem, that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Now this is still a Jewish conversion. The gospel is being given to Jews, and that is the case even in Antioch which will be the first of the Gentile congregation, this potent place of Christ at work in His people. But the first ones who were scattered spoke only to Jews. first ten years or so of the church was basically Jewish, or included, of course, some Gentiles who had become Jews, or were proselytes to Judaism, who also would be carried over to believe that Christ was their Messiah. And then after that, of course, after those ten or so years, uh, the focus is going to really spread to the Gentiles in the known world, as we know in the book of Acts. We'll follow it through as we work our way to the end. So they were speaking the Word because the Word had transformed them. They were telling the story because Christ had become theirs, and they were continuing to tell others what they had discovered, who had delivered them. Now notice verse 20, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists only, or also preaching the Lord Jesus. Better translation is Greek. Spoke to the Greeks, Gentiles, who were in that same city of Antioch. So there were those from Cyprus and Cyrene, some men who came from those places, who began to speak to the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. 
When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. He needs a helper. He's going to go get Saul to be that helper. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a, while, for a whole year they met with the church, taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading and the hearing <clears throat> of His Word. Spontaneous impulse of a truly born-again child of God early on is to tell somebody. To talk about the one who has transformed your life. To declare what you believe Him to be. That He is the Lord, Messiah, Redeemer. And that was true at the very beginning of the church when the basic majority of the church were scattered out of Jerusalem by the persecution led by Saul, led by the man who would become the greatest apostle of the Gentiles later on, persecuting the church at first and causing them to scatter. I think this incident probably suggests to us as much as anything that there is a universal obligation to Christians to be Christians wherever we go and to talk about our Redeemer wherever we live and to be representing Him no matter where we're sent because we are the carriers of that life in Christ Jesus. And He uses us because our witness is new and good and true and usable to Almighty God. He anoints the message of that gospel as we tell it and share it. The message is pretty simple. The message was pretty easily spoken. They preached the Lord Jesus. Or to put it another way, they preached Jesus is the Christ or the Lord. That was their message. They said, yeah, he, that one that everybody heard about that was so disturbing to the whole culture around Jerusalem and in Judea and beyond, He really is. He's the Lord. He has changed us. We have met Him. We are not the same. It is because of Him preaching. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah of Israel. Believe in Him. Trust Him. And God prospered their message, their lives, there in Antioch and other places where they went. The hand of the Lord was with them, verse 21 says, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. That's the effect of the gospel when we proclaim it, trusting Him and not concerned about anything else except that we get His name out there and tell the gospel so that others might be saved. Now, at the very beginning of this text, and I don't want to leave this out. I want you to see it with me. The church spread from Jerusalem, moved over toward Caesarea. Remember the story of Caesarea? We were in that last week. Paul was defending, I mean, Peter was defending himself for what he did in Caesarea and the house of Cornelius and the salvation of Gentiles. Or at least, at worst, Gentiles who were about to be Jews. And they were converted when he declared the gospel in the house of Cornelius. That's Caesarea, right on the coast of the Mediterranean. When we open this text, we discover that they went as far as Phoenicia after this persecution began following Stephen, and Cyprus, and Antioch. Anybody look at a map this week if you get a chance to look at that text? If you go up from Caesarea right up the coast of the Mediterranean, which basically goes north, leaning a little east, right along the coast you're going to run an entire side in Phoenicia. The province of Phoenicia runs right on the coast 
running straight on up from Caesarea. And if you go on up past Phoenicia, and you look to your left, there's an island out there a little ways. The island is right out there, right in clear view once you get close enough to it. Cyprus is the island. And then you come back to the coast, go right up a little ways further, and there's Antioch, before you make a turn back toward Asia. Right up near the top of the Mediterranean on the eastern shore, there is Antioch. So they're moving, journeying right in line with what's there. I'm not sure how it got over to Cyprus. Yes, I am sure. It got over to Cyprus because when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, there were people from Cyprus who were there who heard them speaking of God's greatness in their language by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you. This is not my guess. This is proven true. The Holy Spirit came and everybody speaking a language, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language what they're saying? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. Ah, that's good. Belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, let's go a little further, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in their own tongues the mighty works of God. Cyrene, you remember the Cyrenian, along with his Cyprus buddy, started preaching to the Greeks. If you come down out of Palestine and come around the corner and get to Egypt, you go to Alexandria, you're still about 450 to 500 miles from Cyrene right across the southern part of the Mediterranean, comes to Cyrene, part of Libya. That was the Cyrenian along with the guy from the island who got together in this little town where the word was spreading and started telling Greeks about Jesus because they'd gotten that back home from the day the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost. And somebody had gone home and talked about it. And there were believers there who would later come after the persecution came and head back up the country sharing the gospel with whoever would hear them. There's a lot of detail I don't have in that, but that's where it all started. And they start telling the Gentiles, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus spreading from Pentecost through persecution to the places where God intended it to go because the promise was that the Holy Spirit would be upon them and they'd preach the gospel and they would fill the place up from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That the gospel would be preached finally everywhere in the earth. This is the beginning of everywhere. This is the start of the preaching that spreads the gospel around the world. Now, Barnabas is sent. And this is going to be the heart of what I want to say today. And it's going to be a short sermon. Everybody said? With no agreement, it'll be a long sermon. You just have to have agreement on these things. The report came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And a great number, you know, had believed, so they sent Barnabas to Jerusalem, to Antioch, from Jerusalem to Antioch. And he got to town, and this is what it says. We're going to think about what he saw, what he felt, and what he said. He's the reporter. And we get a full expression of Barnabas' attitude when he sees what's going on. Simple statements, bold truths, 
And this is what he saw. When he came and saw the grace of God. Now, let me ask you this question. Now, we, some of us have been Christians a long time, and we kind of know, we think we know about what it is to see the grace of God. But what is being said here? When Barnabas is able to go into that city and see what's happening and say, there's the grace of God. What is he measuring, do you think? Now, for a lot of people, he's measuring about what was measured in the house of Cornelius or back in Jerusalem. The dynamic of the Holy Spirit bringing languages that one didn't know, hearing those languages spoken, the power of God at work. Maybe somebody healed dramatically so that it is a revelation. But it doesn't say any of that, does it? So we don't know. What I believe, and I have said this so many times, I've had people ranting and raving about some event they thought was God, watching it on television, finding something they really thought must be God. The question I always ask, if you keep going somewhere because you think it's God, what are you looking for? How do you know it's God? How do you recognize the grace of God? And, and my report to several younger pastors, particularly in days gone by, was look for the nature of Jesus. Look for the character of the Son of God to discover whether or not the grace of God is there. What is the character? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness. The nature of the very life of God, the one who walked among us, His name being Jesus of Nazareth. What did he see? He saw real life in the context of a Gentile people. He saw love. He saw them loving each other, sharing with each other. He saw them doing what people do when Christ lives in them. Augustine made this statement, and I'm not sure what his focus was when he made it. Augustine's a theologian that both Protestants and Catholics brag on. We like him. Potent, powerful man of God. Augustine said, where Christ is, there is the church. That's a good statement, isn't it? Now, would you be able to tell where Christ is and recognize the church? There's a lot of things that express who he is. Someone suggested, and I think this may be a good suggestion, take Augustine's statement and say it this way. Where the grace of Christ is visible, the nature, the life of Christ is visible. There is the church. Where you see Him at work. Where you notice how people deal with each other. The nature of because what He makes us when we're born again is a new creation in Christ. And the old things are passed away and all becomes new. And as we begin to live as His, we're able to love when we couldn't love before. Someone wounded you, hurt you, and the first time you see them after your conversion and you're just brand new in it, you don't feel what you felt all of a sudden. And you wonder, how did it happen? It happened through conversion. It happened through transformation. It happened through a renewal of who you are. A new person has been raised inside of you. It's you, but it's you plus. It's you in the realm of the Spirit. It's you indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It's you kept by the power of God. It's you walking out what has happened on the inside. The true test of Christianity is the visible presence of a grace that can only be recognized as from the character of God. A grace that lays down a life for another. A grace that is able to treat kind and pray for an enemy. A grace that never stops giving of themselves no matter how many times they get stepped on by those they're giving to. 
It's a supernatural life in Christ Jesus. It's not just adding Jesus as a bag on the side. I got another, I got another backpack full of something new here. No, it's not that. It's making you brand new. You submit to the cross. You die to yourself and to sin. You're buried with Christ in baptism, pictures this, and you're raised unto newness of life, and now you're indwelt and guided and blessed by the Spirit who dwells within you. It's not just some mediocre life with a Christian label. It's a new beginning. I had a conversation today with uh, my newspaper man. He throws a chronicle. Now I've had several conversations with him. He likes to talk with me. I like to talk with him. He's, he doesn't go to church right now. He's always apologizing for that. <laughs> Knows he needs to. About daybreak this morning, I caught him as he delivered my paper because I'd been up here in the church doing some things, and I drove out, and we drove up together, and he handed me my paper, and he said, Hey, how you doing? I said, I'm blessed, doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. He said, hey, what about this same sex thing? What do you think about that? <laughs> hey, come on, it's too early in the morning to even get started with that. Too early. What about that? He said, I, what do you think? I knew, he was, I knew he was ready to really pound on me if I disagreed with him. I wasn't about to disagree with him because he and I are on the exact same page when it comes to what we were talking about. I said, here's my position, our position as a church, our position as believers. The only marriage there is is between a man and a woman. And we know what that is from Genesis 1, the very beginning. Because that's how God set, that's how God set it up. And he, and he put a man and a woman together that they might produce children. Some of us have had children. And we at times have wondered about that, but we knew it was a good idea. Propagate the earth. Fill it full of people. Some people are really good at it. They have a lot of children. But it was a good conversation. He said, he said well, are, are all preachers taking that position? Now listen, this is a guy outside the loop. I said, are all preachers where you are with that? I said, I hate to tell you this, but no, they're not. Evangelical pastors, in many cases, are saying a lot of things are okay because uh, of the pressure that's on them to say it's okay. There are a lot of guys that are going to lose their jobs if they don't stick with it, and that's going to be tough. Some of them are just going to do it because we've changed so much in this culture. We don't go by what the Bible says. We go by what we feel is right. And when you get wrong thinking and you feel that wrong thinking is right, you do all kinds of things in a culture. That's the problem. My problem is, my desire is, to be able to love and care for and treat as a human being, a person just like I am, every single one who comes. Every single one I get connected with, I'm going to do that best I can. But I can tell you, I will not be able to perform a wedding between two men or two women or whatever else, because it is not God's plan. And we will stick with what is taught in Scripture in order to do the will of God. Somebody said, it has to do with love, Pastor. It's not about, I've read whole sermons where an evangelical pastor takes every text in the Bible that deals with homosexuality and flips it on its head and calls everyone a bigot who can't recognize genuine love between two men or two women. That's not, what it, that's not the issue. That's not even the issue. The issue is, what does God say? So you love the sinner, but you cannot accept the next step. And that, you know, we would have no problem out there letting people live the way they want to live. It's this radical, aggressive effort to make us say what is right when it's wrong. That can happen if you go with this book. That's why we read the book, right? So we know what God's idea is, how He thinks. If we don't keep reading it and studying it and knowing it, we're going to get trapped one of these days, and we're going to think, it's okay. It's all right if someone wants to have a lover like that. 
women with women, men with men. Paul didn't think it was right. Read Romans 1. God didn't think it was right. Read the opening chapters of the Bible. Read the New Testament. Read the whole from beginning to end. That's not the biggest issue in the church anyway, and we'll talk about that another time, and I'll tell you when that time is going to be soon. But that's not the biggest issue. The biggest issue for us is who is God? And how much authority does He have in your life? Do we get to change the rules? Or do we have to submit to what God is saying in order to walk with God? That's the question. Who is this God to us? Is He a living God who has authority? Or is He just someone we can command? Or we can do what we want to and ask God to bless and it's going to be okay. I don't care how many blessings you pass over sin. It's just blessed sin. And the blessing is not the blessing of God. It becomes the blessing of man. And you can't, you can't okay what God is not okay. It's that simple. And we know that. Is it possible to love someone? I hope so. Someone who isn't thinking that same way? I hope so. We have to because we're commanded to love our enemies even. And all those people are not standing around as enemies. They're just standing around needing God's redemption that will set them free. We only tell what we know to be true and leave it lay and pray. So we'll talk about it some more. I wasn't even going to be in the sermon today. That's what I get for <laughs> reading ahead the story. But it's important, isn't it? And just think about this. What, what's going to happen if we're not careful is just what happened with abortion. Once we don't get it nailed in the head and stopped with the truth, it just spreads. It gets okayed. You finally get a law that says it's good, and you get all of that. And we get upside down law in the United States of America. What we're doing now is passing laws that okay people to do what they want to do. We had negative law in the, in the Ten Commands. There were few do-nots, and that was it. What's that mean? That means the rest of living, if we lived it away from and not breaking those commandments, if we just lived it freely, we'd be walking with God. You didn't need a bunch of positive laws that said it's okay for you to have a same-sex marriage and have all the benefits and rights. Just like man and woman, this is as if God were okaying it. That's upside-down law. That's making law not don't do these, you can do everything else, but makes it, listen, we'll, we'll have a law so that you can do what you want to do. It's okay. Oh, I've stepped into it today, I know. <laughs> but that's okay. Because we, you know, we're going to run into it, and we're going to hear people talking about it, and it's time to go to the Scriptures again. And we're going to do that. Barnabas rejoiced in what he saw when he got there. It said he was glad. Another translation said he rejoiced. Can we rejoice wherever God works? Can we see God and His grace at work and raise our hand and say, Hallelujah, that's great. Even if we're not the ones engineering it, a lot of people can't. But we have to do that. We have to be able to recognize where the true grace of God is working and say, bless you, bless you. Follow along. And then he gave them a word, verse 23. Saw the grace of God, he was glad, and here it is. He exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. And I'm, for my title, I use the statement from the King James Bible. Steadfast, yes. Focused in heart, yes. Cleave, cling, hold to the Lord. Now remember the Lord is this Jesus that they've been preaching because they're preaching that Jesus is Lord. 
And here is a word from Barnabas that says, Cleave to the Lord, this one Jesus. How you doing with that? I mean, is, is Jesus the center? Is He the one you're holding on to? Is that the one you are always seeking to know better? Is He the one that you're drawing near to all the time? Do you go to the Scriptures in order to know Him better? Do you go to the Scriptures in order to draw near to Him that He might have His way in your life? Are you clinging to the Lord? When I first was converted, and some of you had this same experience, I know, I was told to read the Bible, and I was told where to start. I was told to pray every day. I was told to give my tithe. <laughs> right up front, we got that message, and that was good. For me, it was good. And we were told to witness to somebody. Tell them about Jesus, your Savior. Anybody else hear those instructions when you first were converted? It was pretty basic stuff. And uh, there wasn't a lot else. I didn't get a manual except the Bible. That was our manual. And uh, we were told, all this stuff's going to help you know Jesus better, and you're going to draw near to Him. And in prayer and in the Scriptures and in everything you're doing, walk with Him. Follow Jesus as he leads. I like that. Because I think it's simple enough for us to get so caught up in the extra things of the Christian church, the things we do, and the things we think about. and Even if you get a certain focus on theology and you got it all figured out, if you're not careful, you keep figuring it out to the point that your Lord stands over here and you've spent all your time thinking about your theological order. It's possible to have theology down without Jesus. That's why I like J.I. Packer so much when I sat in his class at Regent, first year I was there. And Dr. Packer, with his English accent, would come in. He was an interesting guy. But he'd come in and he'd say, Theology! It's for doxology. Let's stand. We're going to worship first. And he said, if you study theology and get all of the parts of it right, no matter what pattern you use, and do not worship God, you have missed the point. We're going to sing the doxology. We'd stand with that Englishman leading us, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And we go right through that all the way. And by the time we sat down, we're ready for a little theology. Worshiping the God we were about to learn some things about. And I've tried to keep that in my mind. That's been my heart from early on. I want to worship Him. I want to know Him. But I also found as a pastor, you could get so busy doing stuff that you didn't have time to sit with Him in His Word and draw near to Him. No time to really know Him or to be known by Him and shown who you are by His Word. And you can be like one of those big oak trees that we've seen, or big elm tree, giant, standing tall, looking green, marvelous, windstorm comes through and it breaks and falls. Why? Because the whole inside is rotted. And all you had was the exterior. That can happen to Christians, preachers, men and women in Christ who might have met Jesus a long time ago. It is possible if we do not cultivate knowing Him through the Word and by the Spirit, do not worship, do not seek His face over time. We can be busy doing church stuff and rotting on the inside. That's the danger. When worship then becomes something I might attend rather than something I do. Something I might go watch rather than something my heart does. 
It's why entertainment in America works so good in churches. Singers sing for you. You don't ever have to. All kinds of things happen. Very little of it brings me to my knees. A living person is who we cling to and know. Our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. He is the foundation of what His work is, the foundation of His church, the cornerstone, the whole thing. And all forgiveness and reconciliation comes because of that cornerstone who made possible that redemption, and we living stones are buckled into Him, part of the building. We've got to maintain a relationship with the living Lord. You heard David a while ago reading from John 15, one of my favorite texts, as some of you know, because it talks about abiding in Him and He abiding in us. It talks about we being attached to the vine as branches to Jesus, that we are grafted in there by the Father Himself as we have put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That graft has to be maintained for the life of the vine to continue to furnish life to the branch and bring forth fruit which grows on the branches but is a result of the vine life on the inside. So if we don't cultivate the union we have with Christ, if we don't cultivate that connection to Him where we're grafted into the vine so that the flow of His life is always there and the Spirit is able to work freely into us the characteristics of our Lord. We never bring the fruit that He wants. And when you think you've just about got it figured out and the fruit grows on your life, look at that, I've got a grape, a grape, one little grape. Look at this, Lord, I produced a grape for you right here on me. He said, what? Now we trimmed you back so you can produce two grapes next year. Or three or four. Because the, you know what it is to prune something and, and think you're killing it. We thought David killed the crepe myrtle in front years ago. You seen that big crepe myrtle right in the middle? He trimmed it right down to the stump, right down to the stump. Is that right, David? Did you pray over it after that? or did you <laughs> It just took off. There's life in that vine. When there's life in the vine, it produces life in branches. What Jesus accomplished on the cross Death, resurrection is what we enjoy. We die with Him on that cross. We identify with Him in His death. We're buried with Him. We're living as raised with Him right now in this physical body. We live as resurrected children of God, depending on His life alone to bring glory to God and to produce the fruit that makes a difference in human lives. God, help us. Help us. What does it mean when he says, come unto me? That's what he means. All you who labor and are heavy laden, come to me. I'll give you some rest. Well, that's what we found when we got converted. That's what we found in the gospel. Rest for the soul. No more sin-pounded lives. No more guilt-saturated existence. Freedom. Then he said, follow me. <laughs> oh, boy. Now we're His, and He says, come to me, we like that. And He says, follow me, and that's just ongoing. That's what we do the rest of our being, the rest of our lives. We follow Jesus. We listen. We respond. We pray. We follow. We turn to the Lord. We begin to be His. We continue by cleaving to Him, clinging to Him, holding to Him as the blessed child of God. You who are His, remember this. You're not His because you were good. You're not His because you climbed the tree into His kingdom. You're not His because you earned it. You're His because He loved you. God the Father loved you sent His only begotten Son into the world to die for you, 
raised him out from among the dead to say to the Father, It is finished, done, complete. My children redeemed. That's who we are. Because of Jesus, we are His. I think the thing that really focused me on thinking about Jesus today among all the other parts of this was thinking about Frankie's life. Simple. But Frankie Paskett, when you talked about God with Frankie, she'd talk about Jesus. Jesus was her Savior and her Lord. And you may not know much about Frankie, but Frankie and Mike were pretty banged up in a car wreck that almost killed them. And if you knew Frankie and the picture we put in the bulletin last week, and it wasn't put there on purpose, it just happened to be the week she came up. That was last week's bulletin. That was Frankie as we knew her. She's about half that big when she left. But on her face, if you got close to her, she had scars all over the place. They weren't fresh scars. They'd been there a long time, 40 years. But it was that car wreck. And they drank a lot then. She didn't mind telling her. She'd tell this story herself, which is by to this day she hated even one thought of one sip of any kind of alcohol. But they almost died. And it was in that recovery that God put a grip on them, brought them to Christ's church, where they professed their faith in public, and we baptized them in that baptistry a week later, 38 years or so ago. She never stopped talking about Jesus. She never stopped loving him and being loved by him. She was hard-headed. Now, she can't fuss at me now. <laughs> but I never saw anybody in my life, in her and her place of income, who could give so much of herself, of her money, to help somebody else. And she was doing it Fairly recently, because Ray told me yesterday, and I already knew this, Ray Lamb, he said, I'm here because of her. I'm here in this church because of her. She was the one who invited him, ministered to him. She kept loving and talking about Jesus. I don't know of a better heritage. Washed in the blood, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, Alive in Jesus. How do we cling to him? What do we do? Listen, you've got to finally find some time to just sit down somewhere with him and say, Lord, I'm here. I know you're alive. I know you hear me. I know your spirit dwells in me. I need to say to you, thanks for this life that you've given to me. Thanks for this salvation. I love you. And I know I love you because you made me it possible for me to love you. You changed my heart. You made me yours. I love you, Lord. Forgive me for blowing it today. Now, Frankie would have to do this every once in a while, I know. Thank you for being with me when I blew it, forgiving me. Probably said too much. Her soul would cling to the dust if she could get a word from the Lord, listening to his word. My soul clings to the dust. The psalmist said, give me life according to your word. Psalm 119, 25, you want to look at it. That would be Frankie. Some of us, when hearing stories, how struggle, difficulty somebody's going through, we'd say, in my struggle, Lord, I will never forsake you. You remember somebody already said that? I'll never forsake you, Lord. I'll be there all the way to the end. Watch that confession. Because sometimes things happen that are bigger than we imagine. Maybe it's better to pray this. Lord, 
In my weakness, heed me where I am. If so be that I may lay hold on that for which also I was laid hold on by Jesus Christ. Paul's prayer. After 35 years or so of following Jesus, writes to the Philippians in chapter 3, and he said, I just, I'm, I'm endeavoring to hold on to that for which I've been comprehended. To somehow comprehend what he comprehended me to do. To do what he brought me into the kingdom for. That's all. That was his walk. Paul's boast was where? Always in the Lord. Instructing his church, his people, us. Make your boast in the Lord if you're going to boast. Not boasting in the flesh, not boasting in gifts, not boasting in anything but Jesus. That was Frank. May that be us. We have a walk yet ahead of us. A life to live in this world for Him. May God so fill us with His Spirit and His presence that we can say, Lord, I love you and I love the intimacy we have together when I kneel in prayer. I love the privilege of seeking your face. I love the opportunity to hold on my lap your word and listen to your voice as that word comes alive, shaping me. Cleave to the Lord. Cling to Him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Your Word is a lamp to us, a light to our path, and we're thankful that it is. Your Holy Spirit, Your Spirit dwells within us, empowering that truth to our minds and our hearts. I pray, Lord, today that there are those in this room who might think about their relationship to you. And if they do not know you, not born yet again from the work of the Spirit, may they think on these things, turn toward you, receive your grace. Thank you for your working today in us. In Jesus' name, amen. One